Welcome to the Memories of a Moonbird podcast, exploring life one story at a time. Hello, friends. I'm Daniel Sherl. Today on the show, I'm excited to welcome one of the coolest women you'll ever meet. For more than 30 years as an assistant director in network television and studio feature films, she's worked on some of the biggest shows and with the biggest stars on programs like The Sopranos, Veronica Mars, The Shield, X-Files, CSI, and Deep Space Nine, just to name a few. She eventually created her own production company called Wanderlust Films and began writing, producing, and directing her own projects. Over her long career and as a woman in the entertainment business, she's seen just about everything from the darkest moments that led to the Me Too movement to the brightest accomplishments of a well-trained cast and crew. A lover of horror movies, a proud mom, and an uncensored kick-ass human being, please welcome my friend Vanita Ozels Graham. Vanita, welcome to the show. Woohoo! Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm excellent. Uh, yeah, this is fun. I've been looking forward to doing this. It's so great to have you here. Let me ask you the first question. Where were you born and raised? I was uh, the, the child of immigrants, Latvian immigrants. They landed on the shores of America and popped me out. And uh, so I spoke Latvian growing up and um, in New York City. And I went to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn and majored in film and knew from the time I saw my first Academy Award show that I was destined for Hollywood. Uh, so what was little Vanita like when she was a child? Uh, exactly like Wednesday Adams. I had two long <laughs> grades. I was creepy as shit. <laughs> I was the weird kid at school. <laughs> and I was okay with that because I knew I was cool. I had no problem. <laughs> so to all the kids out there in the world listening who are weird themselves, you should know be proud of who you are because you're awesome. Uh-huh. Yeah. What was it like having Latvian parents? And have you been back to Latvia since? Yes, I went back twice. I finally went back. I took my daughter with me. Um, my whole life I wanted to go, but Latvia is not the easiest place to get to. It's a little bit out of the way, way up there in the Baltic states. You know, it's not like flying to mm -hmm. Paris. You've got to fly to Amsterdam and then take a shuttle flight or Vienna or whatever. But I finally did it. And it was the most remarkable experience of my life. But traveling is, I think, the most educational, both emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, thing that anybody can do. Agreed. Uh, when I went back there, I had a little itinerary of the things I wanted to do to find my past, to find my parents, because they were forced out during World War II. Mm. They were magnificently well-off people who um, had beautiful homes, several homes, and uh, had to flee and leave it all behind. And so I got the little pieces of information of where they lived and I was able to, with my daughter Bridget, go find them. And for instance, out in the country, we had an apple orchard farm that was magnificent. And my mm. great grandfather had designed it, built it. So it was in my family for all those years. And, and you were able to go find this place? Yes, I was. I, I was so lucky. I found a tour guide named Tom's Rodus. He is a <laughs> Latvian tour guide who does walking tours of Riga. And Bridget and I fell in love with him. He used to be a world-class Latvian so champion soccer player who hurt his knee and then had to find mm. a different occupation. So he became a tour guide because he's a very funny, open fellow. How cool. And yeah. So he took us on our first tour. The first time we went, it did not go so well. Our, my very first day there, we met Tom's in the lobby of the hotel. And as we walked out, I tripped on a step and broke my ankle, rushed <sighs> me off to the hospital. And I was on crutches for the next two weeks in Latvia. So Bridget oh, and Tom's got very close because he took her everywhere <laughs> walking. And she come back to the hotel. I say, so how'd it go? What did you see? But oh, so man. I said, okay, we're coming back next year when I can walk again. So I did get to see some of Latvia the first time, but we came back a second time. And by that time, we'd become good friends with Tom's. And he really did us a favor. He drove all the way down the coast of Latvia with us, with his sister, spent the night in a hotel, and then helped us find on these weird little maps and backwoods roads, these properties that my parents had. And amazingly, the people who live there now were the grandchildren of my forebearers who knew my ancestors. Wow. And like you, my grandmother, she lived there while they first moved in. So I got an enormous amount of history of my family, as well as Latvia. Do you think you could ever go back there and live? Yeah, I thought about it. I asked my husband. I said, I could actually see moving to Latvia. And he goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> said, okay, fine. I'll just go back and visit. Well worth the journey. 
well worth the journey. So Vanita, how long in total have you been working in the entertainment business now? Since I was 24. I flew out, got in the uh, Director's Guild Assistant Director's Training Program. And for two years, they trained me at every studio in Hollywood and also the big production companies. So then I got my days in. I was qualified to be a second assistant director. And I just worked steadily after that until I got my days in to become a first assistant director. And then I worked steadily on that. And then it was up to me to figure out how to become a director. I always thought being an assistant director meant that you were a baby director, (laughs) that you would become a director. Mm -hmm. No, it's actually the pathway to become a producer. And I had no interest whatsoever in being a producer. I'm a creative person. I write and I want to direct. So it was a struggle for me figuring out how to cross over from production into the creative end of the business. And I had a few almost opportunities like um, alienation. They said, you've been approved to direct an episode in the back 13. I was like, great. And um, right as my episode came up, Barry Diller canceled the show. He got in the tiff with the executive producer. I was going to get a chance directing a show called Second Chances with Connie Selica. The earthquake hit and destroyed the entire set. As well as we discovered she and her co-star were both pregnant. And it was a show about single women finding love. So they canceled (laughs) the show. (laughs) um, Several things like that happened to me where I was just about to get my dream and poof, it went away. So I began to realize this, this is not going the way I thought it was going to go. I thought there would be like a natural path. And finally, I got to the place where I'd had enough of being a first assistant director. How many years can you do it? And I decided to just stop. And I created a production company with Bridget, Wanderlust Films. And I made a horror movie short from a scene in a horror movie I'd written. And I picked the juiciest, horrific scene in the whole movie. And I spent my own money and quite a lot of it uh, having top-notch Hollywood special effects. And, you know, typical two girls stop at a gas station at night and don't go in. Well, they do. And (laughs) all hell breaks loose. (laughs) And uh, I wanted to prove that I could direct horror and uh, violence as well as a man. Well, no, wait, let me ask you, why horror? Because that's going to be one of my questions. What's with the love of horror? Why does it compel you? Since I came out of the womb, Latvians, I think, um, have a, a kind of a dark nature to our culture. When I was a little girl, I remember my grandfather sitting by the fire reading a book with pictures in it. And I remember looking over his lap and there was a werewolf in one of the pictures. And I went, what's that? And he said, Vilka Villa. And I said, what's that? And he goes, werewolf. I said, what's that? (laughs) And so he educated me on what a werewolf is. And uh, well, you know, Morovia, Transylvania, those Eastern European blocks, very similar to Latvia, that we have that kind of dark, historical, strange side to us. And so I I just think it's innate in my DNA that I've been interested in horror my whole life. So it's been over 30 years then that you've been working in entertainment. Was your first professional job as an AD? Yes. An assistant director trainee, actually, for the Directors Guild, because I was in the program. And that lasted for 500 working days, which was a little over two years. And for people who don't know, can you explain what an assistant director does? I would summarize it by saying they maintain order on set, they take care of the production schedule, they take care of health and safety of the crew and logistics and stuff. Is there more to it than that? It depends on who your director is. I happily segued into working with a handful of directors like Kenny Johnson, who did The Bionic Woman, um, The Incredible Hulk, V, Shadow Chasers. Uh, He's a science fiction guy. And science fiction is my second love after horror because sometimes they're actually interconnected. So I wound up working with him when I was a trainee, and then I went on to work with him for the rest of my career. Like every third show would be a Kenny Johnson production. And he would let me occasionally direct something. He'd say, here, I'm busy with this scene. Go over and set up the next scene, and I'll see what you did. And I would do that. And then he'd come in, and he'd look it over, and he'd make his adjustments. But he, he valued my creative abilities. Many people don't look at assistant directors as creative people at all. They look at them as the schedule makers, as you said, running the set, everything's on time, look at your watch all day. Yeah, a lot of people are like, the assistant director is not your friend. He or she is the person that's like, let's go, people, let's go, you know. Correct. And it was difficult for me because I love actors, and sometimes I sort of have to be on an actor's ass to make sure that they were (laughs) moving along. But um, it taught me how to interface with the crew and actors by watching the good directors. I could see what I admired, what worked well, what made actors comfortable. And I could also see 
what made actors close up. And I used those skills when I started directing myself. Well, what do you like most about entertainment as a seasoned veteran in the business? It's the art of storytelling, which is as old as human beings. Cave people were doing it at night around the campfire and painting it on the walls. And we're still doing it. It's how we communicate all of our emotions and thoughts and fears. It's, and to me, movie making is the best. I was a painting major in college and I had a great mentor there. One day he told us, okay, so you're all going to be world-class artists, got a lot of talent. You're going to get an agent. You're going to be stuck in your loft in Soho painting and, and uh, your demons, you're alone with your demons. And then your agent will come over and look at your paintings and say, wow, those are really great. But that's not what's selling right now. So put those aside and this is what I need you to do. And you're going to go out and get drunk that night with all your other drunk artist friends. And then you'll go back and you'll, and you'll be miserable. That's the life that you're looking at. <laughs> and I went, well, what? <laughs> I said, oh, that doesn't sound very good. And then I stumbled into movie making while I was at Pratt Institute in New York. I took a little film class without any thoughts about it at all. And when I got that movie camera in my hand and I started shooting my own little films and writing them, it was an epiphany. I just went, I found it, my people, this is it. I knew from the time I was little that the Oscars and the movies and all that were just brilliant, but I didn't realize that I could do it too. And now that I started doing it, I had to find the way to do it for the rest of my life. I'm curious, do you feel like the entertainment business is actually diverse today? Because diversity is the big hot button thing with our business. So much more diverse than when I started. When I started, it was a white world. <laughs> I mean, whiter than white. Uh, I remember being on a bus one time, going on a location scout. And when we all got off, I looked at the group of people I was in, 20 people. It was all white men and me. And I was a white woman. <laughs> and I remember thinking, gosh, is that a coincidence? And then I started watching every ep show that I was on and I couldn't help but notice, my God, we're all white. Uh, I'm, I'm saying not one person of color or ethnicity. Uh, the only other women on the set were script supervisors, makeup women, and costume designers. And the Directors Guild was actually wonderful about that. One of the things about the training program they were trying to do was to get more diversity into the movie business. It was also cheap slave labor for them, but they had an altruistic motive as well. And it did help. In my class, I remember there was um, one black male and one black female and uh, two other women, I think. So, wow, that was a pretty diverse group of assistant directors. And so through the years, we started um, flourishing and increasing in number. And, and I also started seeing a few faces of color in the crew here and there. And it's the same thing with casting. It was a hell of a white world back then. I mean, when I think about episodic TV, the bionic woman, um, I don't remember one black cast member. I really don't. Now, I'm not saying there weren't. There might have been, but I don't remember one. The whole show was just white. And that really needed to change because obviously people of color don't see themselves anywhere on TV or in the movies. That, that's got to be seriously damaging. Right. It's like you're invisible. You don't matter. And, and there was no real alternative for them until I think in the 70s, they started making some um, episodic shows that were, you know, about black families, Bill Cosby, et cetera. So, yeah, that really, really needed to change. Do you feel, though, that the opportunity is being spread evenly amongst, you know, people of color, you know, Latinos, women, LGBTQ, et cetera? Or are you seeing it swayed only in one group? <laughs> People of color, yeah. And women, a little more probably than men, even. And I'm not sure why that is. It just it appears that way to me. Yeah, this is, I'm not an expert at any of this. This is all my personal observation. Um, but having been in the industry for over three decades, I've watched a transition with my own eyes. So it's something that I see. Uh, I, I will say, um, it's a great thing mm -hmm. the, because the world truly more than I believe statistically more than 50% of our population are different ethnic groups. I think white people are the minority now. So shouldn't more than 50% of what we see on the screen reflect that. This is what I find interesting about where we are in the movie business right now and television. 
all the film festivals I'm seeing other than genre festivals. And many of the films, it's not about entertainment anymore. It's about educating entertainment, about social issues, about humanity. Uh, I mean, obviously storytelling is about that in a general way anyway, but about social issues. And we're very serious right now. This is not a time where there's, other than Marvel movies, sheer entertainment. And I actually, I'll be honest with you, I, I miss it. I miss the really just fun movies. I miss the days of, and forget about COVID for a minute, but I miss the days of just going to the theater to have a couple laughs for an hour and a mm -hmm. half and detach and have some popcorn, hang out with my friends. You know, I, I, I feel like it's harder and harder to find just solid, fun entertainment. I think that's why movies like Marvel movies and Deadpool have such a huge audience because that's sort of the last place you can go to just escape reality. Mm -hmm. you know, reality has crept into the film industry big time. Do you think that the pendulum is going to swing back towards the middle? Yes. Yeah, I do. What does that look like to you? <sighs> More diversity. Hopefully, God willing, we'll all be looked at equally. And everybody will tell their own story and use who um, fits the part for their story. Storytelling is so personal. Hamilton broke that mold in an interesting way. It made me think when, I, when I'm casting my movies, I now cast and write with that little voice in my head, could this be um, somebody who's not white? I don't know what it could be, but just not white because I have such a, a white filter having been raised in you know the 50s for Christ's sakes when I was born uh, it, it carries over into how I tell stories and I'm trying to open up my own mind well do you think that's the biggest challenge you face in entertainment no money <laughs> that's funny everyone in this business from independent starter startups to academy award-winning people they all say the same thing money is the biggest challenge yeah yeah hmm. Have you ever considered quitting the business? And if you did, what kept you going? When I was a second AD, I was not getting the opportunity to move up to being a first AD because I was a woman. I think there was one female first assistant director back then. And I was really starting to get concerned that, uh, you know, I would knock on a door and I had so much experience as a second AD and such a great reputation. And I, I'm tall, five foot nine and strong. And you can tell I've got, you know, I'm powerful. I can run a set. But... They would say, well, what have you done as a first assistant director? And I'd say, well, a second unit on Dukes of Hazzard and a, <laughs> and a this and a that. But they were afraid to give me the opportunity to run a set because they didn't trust that I could handle it. And, and it's very difficult. Being a first AD, you've got to be able to be a ball buster when you have to be. You're handling 80 to 100 men sometimes. And there a lot of them are... Um, very blue collar. They're construction workers, scripts, um, electricians, the crew. Anyway, um, yeah, having to uh, run a set where I was the only woman in many cases was a challenge, but I knew I was up to it. So it was a catch-22. They didn't want to let me do it until I did it. And then finally, I, I got my break because I was friends with a lot of stunt people. I love stunt people. My cousin's one. And I happened to be in Jerry's Deli having lunch with my stuntman cousin when the stunt coordinator from the second unit of the Dukes of Hazzard came over to our table. And, and I knew him really well. And he said, so what are you doing? I told him my dilemma. And he said, well, you want to be my first on Dukes? I said, well, yeah, but they're not going to let me. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'll go in, I'll meet the producers and they'll say, yeah, you're a very nice girl, but you haven't done enough. He said, no, I get to pick who I want. So I said, let me meet the producers. I'll do my best. Let's see if I can get in there. So I met the producers and he was right. He was allowed to pick whoever he wanted. So it was this chance meeting. If I hadn't gone to lunch at Jerry's Deli that day, <laughs> I would probably still be, you know, I probably wouldn't be in the movie business anymore because back to your question, did I ever think about leaving the business? Yes, I did because I was terrified that I was never going to get the opportunity to move up. And I did not want to be a career second assistant director. Not that that's a bad thing. There are a lot of people who do that, but that wasn't me. You know, I got in this business to become a storyteller. <laughs> so move yeah. me up. Yeah. And so I, basically you owe your success to a corned beef sandwich. That's how it comes. That's what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I became the first AD on the second unit of the Dukes of Hazard and spent a year having the general league go left to right and having it jump right to left and you know all the and then they moved me up to the first unit when uh, one of the 
assistant directors had to leave. And I got to be a full-fledged first assistant director on episodic television. And on the hit show, it was the number one show in America at the time. So after I got that, boom, I was in. And my career as a first AD took off. I just did one hit show after another. And big, I did all you know what's funny I mean, I- is, is when you think about shows like Dukes of Hazard. I grew up in the '80s. I'm a child of the '80s, and I loved that show growing up. And I haven't gone back and watched it since the '80s when I watched it. But I wonder if by 2020 standards, if I went to watch that show again now, I would look at it and go, "Oh man, this show would never fly today." No, you're very right. Well, all of our television, especially, it's a reflection of what we believe as a society. And sometimes they take chances like Archie Bunker's show, where they they would do things that flew in the face of social norms uh, intentionally, but it was a great way to hold up a mirror to what we really thought and believed, Mm -hmm. but wouldn't say out loud. But those shows were very daring and rare, but wonderful. But for the most part, you'd see shows that reflected kind of a simple... They were just meant to entertain us out of our normal humdrum lives. Like the Dukes of Hazard was a total fantasy. Everybody knew it. Everybody was on board for Daisy Duke's hot pants and Bo and Luke. Yeehaw, good old Boss Hog. Hog. And, and every character was a caricature of somebody. Yeah. When this whole Charlottesville thing happened, there was a mass movement to um, remove the Dukes of Hazard from television because of the General Lee having the flag on it the Confederate flag. Uh, so no, it would not fly. Now. <laughs> it would fly so you, you said you worked on, on golden pond. Yes, I did on golden pond. That, that was fun. I went straight from Xanadu, the insanity of all that, I think to new Hampshire with Catherine Hepburn and Henry Fonda. <laughs> it was one of the best experiences of my life. Yeah. It's such a classic movie. The script was brilliant. The actors were the best who've ever lived in Hollywood. I had the opportunity to watch Catherine Hepburn meet Henry Fonda for the first time. Um, She asked me to let her know the first day he arrived on the set uh, when he was going to be there because she had something she wanted to give him. So I saw his car arrive and I said, uh, Mr. Fonda, Miss Hepburn would like to meet you for a moment before we start. And would you kindly sit on the porch and I'll bring her to you. So I went back, I got Catherine, brought her over, and I noticed she was holding something behind her back. And when she approached Henry, she said, Mr. Fonda, it's astonishing that in all these years that we've been in this business together, we've actually never met. Well, I understand that in this movie, you wear hats. Hats are one of the themes of of your character. So, and she takes out from behind her Spencer Tracy's hat. Mm -hmm. And she said, this was Spencer's. I would like you to have it. Wow. And Henry was just astonished, like blown away. And he said, oh, my God, I can't. And she said, no, no, you can't. It was meant for you. And he said, what can I do in return? And she said, well, I understand that you're a fine artist. And perhaps you could make a painting that included the hat. So that is exactly what he did. At the end of On Golden Pond, he made a lithograph of the three hats that he wore in the film and Spencer's being one of them. And he made a hundred and something copies and he gave her the artist proof. And happily, he gave me one too. It said, for Vanita with warmest good wishes. Love him. That is, what an incredible story. That is fantastic. Yeah. It's one of my favorite movies. It's such a great movie. And it still has survived the ages. It's it's a wonderful film. I'll tell you something. The entire crew had tears in their eyes in the end scene when uh, Jane Fonda is saying goodbye to her father. And instead of saying goodbye, Norman, she goes, well, goodbye, dad. dad. Yeah. Oh, my God. There wasn't a dry eye. I looked around. You know, everybody was crying. It was just <laughs> it was amazing. Well, let's go from something so beautiful to something odd. What is the weirdest or most unique experience you think you've had in the business? Oh, gosh. <laughs> this popped into my head. I was in a dressing room with Zsa, Zsa Gabor and the costume designer. And I watched Zsa, Zsa stuffing pantyhose into her purse and she walked out and I turned to the costume designer and said, did she just steal pantyhose? And she said, oh, honey, that's not all she stole. I, I'm trying to save our wardrobe. She just is like a kleptomaniac. She takes everything home with her. Oh, my God. Like, Are you kidding me? <laughs> Shasha Kapoor needs to steal wardrobe. <laughs> so she's dead. So I can say that. <laughs> 
What do you think is the most valuable lesson that you've learned from your career specifically? To not give up whatever you were, your dream is, your big dream that no matter how challenging it is and how many times you really feel like this is never going to happen for me, that you simply can't give up. You might have to go around in a way you hadn't expected, but opportunities arise for the people who stick to it. And if you hadn't stuck to it, that opportunity would never have shown itself. So just from my own personal experience, putting one foot in front of the other. When I, when I directed my first indie feature, Black Widows, I was terrified because there were so many things I didn't know that I thought I knew, but there's way more to making a whole feature film on your own as a producer that you don't see when you're an assistant director, especially post-production. So I remember driving home one day from the set, sobbing in the car and beating on the steering wheel because I was so frustrated and I didn't know if I was going to be able to do this. It was beyond my skill set. So what I did is I went home that night and I spoke to a higher power. My father had passed away, but he was always my mentor. So I said, dad, I need your help. I'm lost. I don't know what I do next. I, 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 it's the unknown. And I don't know if I'm capable of doing this. And I heard his voice in my head and it was very simple. He said, put one foot in front of the other and the path will be revealed. Hmm. And I went, okay, blind faith. And so I, that's what I did. And I got through it. And then at the end of that, I realized I made a feature film. I got one distributed. I did it. And was it a good one? No. <laughs> but I did it, which meant now I could take that concern, put it aside, and now work on making a good one. <laughs> That is fantastic. Do you think, I'm curious, that being in entertainment has made you a better or worse person? Probably a worse person. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Uh, you have to be single-minded to be successful. This hasn't been easy on my family, probably especially my husband, because you have to give it 100% when you're in the midst of it. So I do have another passion in life that I haven't put nearly enough time into, and that's um, animal cruelty. You like to be cruel and, to animals? Yeah, I love it. It's, it's my <laughs> and I don't have enough time to do that. <laughs> but I, I joined um, a, a group called Compassion Over Killing because I had a little time off between movies at one point. That's awesome. And I thought, let's do something important for the planet. And so I pictured myself doing those undercover gorilla things where you film, you know, animals being abused in factories sure, and, sure. and um, you go out there and you reveal it and you get laws changed. And that's what I pictured. Well, my first assignment was to go to the Whole Foods in Venice and pass out trays of little vegan eggnog for the holiday season. <laughs> 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 and people were looking at me like I was one of those sample people, you know, in the store. And I'm going, this is it. This is how that's, I That's very L.A. That's very L.A. <laughs> so, yeah. But um, I contribute to that. And my dream is that once I'm done with movies, that I could have an animal sanctuary, buy a farm and, and have people help me help abused animals in a rescue thing. That's my dream. Well, Vanita, let's talk about the Me Too movement. You worked through an era of Hollywood whose dark secrets have now come to light over the last few years. I'm curious, how was it for you working during that time? You know, were you were you treated badly, harassed, uh, assaulted because you're a woman? Hell yeah. <laughs> Left and right. People would do things like guys would tell dirty jokes loudly on the set right while I'd be standing close enough to hear them. And they, they did it intentionally to humiliate me. But people outright told me, you know, I listened to my wife screaming at home all night, and then I come to work and I have to listen to you. Yeah, it was bad. And I, I could give you endless stories of what I went through. I got hired on Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and the production manager didn't like the fact that I was a woman. He had a guy that he had wanted to get the job, but the director wanted me. So first thing he said when he met me was, oh, I hear you have a couple of kitties. Is that going to be a problem? Wow. <laughs> to which I responded, would you have said that if I was a man? I mean, Jesus. And what did so, he say? Yeah, um, he's, he backpedaled. He said, well, well, no, but, you know, being a mother is a really important job. And, you know, I, I just 
concern that you will be able to focus your attention here. I said, I have my family life covered. My husband, if you need to know, is taking time off from work while I'm doing this so that he can be Mr. Mom. But not that that's any of your business, but I've got my family life covered. Yeah, it was disheartening. So when did things start to change for you? When did you see the business start to say, hey, some really dark stuff is happening here? I mean, was it with Weinstein that everything just kind of changed or did you see stuff before that? In truth, sadly, it was very recently. There, there was subtle shifts because some men are wonderful and feminists and genuinely respect and honor women, Kenny Johnson being one of them. Um, they have a genuine love for women and they encourage and nurture them. But they're so rare in our industry, unfortunately. But with the Me Too movement, I recall the first day that I started hearing women on the internet talking in massive numbers about that they too had been sexually abused, emotionally abused, whatever. And I wrote on my thread on Facebook, do any of my women friends, do any of you not have a story about being sexually harassed? And ev hundreds of women, every single one said, not me, not me. And then it turned into, have you been abused? Me too, me too, me too. And all of a sudden there was a hashtag in front of it and it was the Me Too movement. I watched it develop in front of my eyes. Well, your daughter is an actress, obviously, and I've had the privilege of working with her and she's awesome. Hello, Bridget, shout out to you. Um, how did you prepare her for the business and did you have to have you know a talk with her about what she could expect as a woman in entertainment? Yeah, yeah. And when she was young, um, she had a manager who will go unnamed that she had that wonderful experience of having him go to her apartment when she was, I believe, 18 years old and tell her that he wanted to see her in um, a bikini because of a, he wanted to make sure her body was fit for the parts that he would be sending her out for. And she had to say no, <laughs> knowing that she would most likely lose his representation, which she did, because when she told me that story, I gave him a call. <laughs> he was gone. And he was uh, lucky that he was not gone with a lawsuit, mm -hmm. which I did, in fact, threaten. And I said, if I ever hear of you doing that to any actress again, you're, you're going to live to regret it. And a note to any actor out there who's listening, man or woman, if your manager tells you that they want to come by your house to see you change into different clothes, that's a very bad sign and you should run the other direction. Never let your manager do something like that because a real manager won't do that. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It was um, being a pretty woman in the industry. Uh, happily for Bridget, she never really got involved in mainstream Hollywood. She's pretty much been under my wing for a lot of it. I mean, she went on a million auditions and did a lot of things on her own, but we've really become a, a producing team, she and I, a writing and producing team. So she gets the joy of being an actress and a writer and a producer, and she directed uh, without having to go through the horrible Hollywood echelon a trial by fire that a lot of people seem to have to go through. Well, I know that we're trying to level the playing field when it comes to gender and ethnicity and all these things. And I know there has been progress, obviously. But what else can we do, in your opinion, as an artist and a woman in the business? How much further do you think we have to go? And what advice would you give to other women and other ethnicities starting out their career today, not just in Hollywood, but anywhere? Uh, the, the arms are open. And this is the first time I've ever seen that in our business. If they have the ability and the drive, they have the best opportunity right now in history to be included in the entertainment industry. So go for it. And the biggest piece of advice I can give everybody starting out is to make your own projects. Uh, I remember hearing that, but it's more important now than ever. The people I see moving up, in mainstream Hollywood are the people who made their own projects and got recognized at film festivals. Somebody noticed this amazing short that they did. So you have to prove yourself before somebody will take a chance on you. That mm -hmm. hasn't changed. You, nobody's going to discover you at the soda fountain. That <laughs> simply never happened and still doesn't happen. Well, let's talk so. about cancel culture for a minute. We live in a world today where if you say the one wrong thing, your entire career could be over, which I vehemently disagree with. I read online earlier today, someone said, 
everyone is greater than their worst mistake. Well, no, in Hollywood is um, all of your Atta girls are gone the minute you do the one dumb shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even I, as a podcaster, right, I have to be aware of cancel culture because it's not that I censor what I say or what I do. In general, I don't. I'm just kind of me and that's who I am. And if people don't like it, they certainly don't have to listen to the show. But I have an awareness of I do need to be a little bit respectful and careful of certain things that I don't cross over lines because I don't purposely want to offend anyone, actually. I just want to entertain and try to bring some light into the world with my podcast. But there is now a fear that there wasn't before when I first started in the business that if I just, if I say the one wrong phrase, if I say the one wrong word, that could be it. I could lose all of my listeners and my show is over. I don't understand it. I'm very much against it. And I don't understand where it came from that we are so, so harshly judgmental of people. Someone said something on Twitter 15 years ago, and now they get banned from acting. And it's like, well, the world was different 15 years ago. Look at television. Look at the jokes we were saying. So how do you feel about that? And how do you think we we come out of that cancel culture to let people see that we're all human beings? People make mistakes and a and little, little more forgiveness. It's absolutely true. For instance, Oprah Winfrey's best friend, Gail King, you know, she's a, she was an interviewer and she interviewed somebody and said something. I can't recall the specifics, but the backlash on social media was so massive that she almost lost her job. And it was, she had to publicly apologize and she totally didn't mean it to be offensive whatsoever. She had no idea the match that she had just struck. And that that is extremely dangerous because people can lose their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. See, um, in your situation, you control your podcast, but if you had sponsors uh, and all of a sudden all your people said, we're not watching anymore, you'd lose your sponsors. Yeah. You can lose your livelihood in the blink of an eye nowadays. Well, that's another reason not to live above your means, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. save money. You just never know when you're going to get canceled. So put your money in the bank, people. Save your money. <laughs> um, well, that's one of the reasons I'm really happy being in control of my work myself with my little production mm -hmm. company. I make barely any money um, compared to when I was in, in AD in Hollywood. I made a lot of money. Now, though, I I don't I'm I don't have to censor everything I say. I have to censor it as a good human being. I have to, because we all have, I believe, prejudices of sorts, different sure. ones. Everybody comes from a different background and we grow up in different ways and we carry that into our adulthood. But the key is to be aware of it and then work on it, not just be aware of it. I've, I've been working on myself a lot because I didn't realize quite the baggage that I had until all of this started surfacing, um, this whole new movement. Well, and that's part of it. I just want to say I agree with you, and I don't understand why it's so difficult for most people to look at other people and go, hey, no matter how old you are and how experienced, we're all works in progress, and we're all products of the environment we grew up in and our parents and a million things that shaped who we are. And so a little bit of forgiveness and understanding goes a long way. And how about we have a conversation about something instead of rushing to judgment? That, that will come. We're not at the place that that's possible yet. And I think it's because there's a whole lot of pain that a lot of people have experienced their entire lives and not just their lives, but their parents' lives and their parents' lives. Uh, we're dealing with an enormous amount of pain out there mm. and also fear and rage and anger. These are remarkable times that we're living in. And um, you have to be very careful. Well, you were a young girl in the 60s. How do you feel that this era today compares to then? Very similar in many ways. I was listening today in the car to the Democratic National Convention of the 1960s. And it, boy, talk about life making a circle right back to where we were then. Uh, the po politically, it's shocking. That was my moment of awareness. My family was Republican, and I was sitting on the sofa in the living room watching the Democratic National Convention next to my father. And I was, at this point, a blooming hippie, wearing bell bottoms and <laughs> doing peace marches. And I remember watching my you know, people getting beaten with batons bloody by the police in Chicago because they were peacefully protesting the convention. And I remember my father saying, oh, my God, look at that. And I, and I said, yeah, I can't believe this. And he said, they should be beating them more. 
And I oh went, my God. I turned, wow, really? And yes. And I went, what? <laughs> and he said, they are so disrespectful of our government. And he went to this whole Republican thing. And I just looked at him and I said, dad, that could be me. I would be there if I lived in Chicago. And I got up and walked out of the room. And that was the last political conversation I ever had with my family. But it's awfully similar in so many ways. And it saddens me enormously. I mean, didn't I march for Roe versus Wade, for, for civil rights, for equality, for women's rights? I would have burned my bra if I wore one, but I didn't. <laughs> uh, and none of that. Now it's, it's all going backwards. It's like, what, did we waste our time? What the hell happened between the 60s and now that we've gotten so regressive in our social views? Well, Vanita, let's talk about what you're doing today. You have a new project at Film Festival. Why don't you tell everybody about it? Yes, I'm very excited about this one. I wrote a short film uh, about a young woman who has the perfect life. Beautiful husband, adorable little toddler, lovely home. It's very 1950s. It feels like father knows best. And, and she's beautiful and her life is beautiful. And you discover in the middle of the film that something is off when she goes to her therapist and says she doesn't need to have therapy anymore. Then the therapist comes to her home that evening because of an event that occurs and we discover the truth of her reality. And I had the great fortune of stumbling into Sean Young, who read the script and said, it's creepy, I'd love to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. It's, uh, it came out exactly the way I wanted it to come out. It's the first movie that I've been able to really say, this is a successful version of one of my scripts. Uh, it was talented people across the board. It looks great. It sounds great. It's fun. It's a great short. I loved watching it. I was very entertained. Thank you. Now, the problem is, as I said earlier, in film festivals right now, it's a challenge because right now in this climate, people aren't looking for that. It's everybody's so damn serious. I just watched a block of, sh of short films in the Newport Film Festival fantastic short films. One of them won the Academy Award last year. I mean, the best short films I've ever seen in my life. And they were all about social issues, every last one of them. So that's what's going on. I'm, I'm hoping that I can find a festival that has one block of, and here's a little something different. <laughs> Here's actually just some entertainment. <laughs> yes. So that's my challenge this year is to find the right homes in film festivals. The first one that we're coming out and having our world premiere in is called Nightmares Film Festival. It's also known as the Con of Horror. So uh, if anybody would like to see Who Wants Dessert on October 21st through October 25th, the festival is happening online and it's very easy to find. You go to nightmaresfest.com and there it is. And you get to select whether you want to get a pass for the whole festival or just one block. Our block is called Recurring Nightmares A. There's a Recurring Nightmares B, apparently. <laughs> so uh, you can see us in there with six or seven other really cool genre films, horror films. And that is our world premiere. We already have several other uh, festivals we've gotten into, but they're not announced yet. So well, we will our... link to that in the show notes so people can go directly to that. Yay. That would be great for them to see. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, how much has travel been a part of your career? A huge part. Uh, happily, um, I got to shoot all over the country. I, I saw things I'd never have seen, like Texas and um, <laughs> New Hampshire from Golden Pond. Uh, all over the country. Is there somewhere that you haven't been that you really want to go? Tahiti, oh. Bora Bora. Since I first saw a Gauguin painting, I went, oh my gosh, that's on my bucket list. And I've done everything on my bucket list except that. So I'm afraid to do it because once <laughs> I've completed my bucket list, uh-oh, <laughs> maybe it's time to check out. So I've been holding off on that. I like going to where the, either the islands, because they're so beautiful, but I like going to history. 
Like, that's why I like mm. Latvia so much, because I felt like I was walking through living history. Uh, when we were in Germany, you know, uh, we were in, in December, we were in Germany, uh, Austria and the Czech Republic. And one of my favorite trips I've ever taken in my life. But we went to Dachau yeah. and I'd never been to a concentration camp before. Not to sound all L.A. dramatic, but it really did change my life. Like I, In I, Latvia, they had uh, when they were taken over by Russia and then by Germany, uh, they have the KGB headquarters there where people were tortured mm -hmm. and killed. And Bridget and I went and we took the tour and um, we had the most remarkable experience, I think, of my life. As we were standing there looking at the holes in the walls and the drains for the blood to go into and the, all the beautiful people, the journalists, the artists, um, the intelligentsia of Latvia were tortured in these rooms. We heard singing and the guy took us out into the courtyard, opened the large double doors that the vans used to bring these poor victims through. And there was a liberation parade happening in Riga of all the different wow. um, regions in Riga that weekend were celebrating the 100th anniversary and they were singing and in native costumes and it was magnificent. And the contrast between the, the suffering these people went through to have this beautiful liberation was profoundly moving. That, that's amazing. I mean, I cried. I really cried. Well, speaking a little bit of loss, uh, you've lost both your folks. Yeah. I remember when I lost my dad, I talked to you and you said the thing that really got to me after my folks died was that I realized there's no one now between me and the beyond. <laughs> <laughs> the abyss. The abyss. The abyss. That's yeah. it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I heard that somewhere. I remember thinking, oh my God, that is spot on. And I yeah. said that to Bridget. I said, when I'm gone, you're going to be facing that abyss. <laughs> so I'm curious, it's been how many years? For my dad, I was 40. So like 20 years. From your perspective, do you have any wisdom to pass on about loss and grief and the human experience? Yes. I had a, an unbelievable experience when my dad died. I was sobbing in my bedroom and it was dark because I had the drapes drawn and inconsolable. And all of a sudden at the foot of my bed, I saw some shadowy figures and I looked at it and I was like, what is that? And then I saw some more figures behind them and more behind them. And then it was like this unbelievable growing group of people. And it hit me all at once that they were my ancestors. Hmm. That these were they came to console me and to show me that I'm a link in a chain, that I'm not alone right now, that they all preceded me and helped create me, and that I, in turn, am passing on the baton. And it was the most profound experience, probably, of my life. And I realized I'm not alone. I'm part of the gang. <laughs> <laughs> and how has that, how has that yeah, helped you I, through the years? Uh, very uh, consoling uh, because I, I felt completely alone because my mother was gone, my sister was gone, and now my father was gone. I was the only remaining family member. So that was devastating. And um, to all of a sudden be given that comfort of knowing that I feel like they were watching out for me because I, I, this, I, don't, I didn't create that at all. It was something that I watched unfold with wide eyes. <laughs> I was like, what is going on here? And uh, I guess the thing about guardian angels, the people from our past who are gone are still with us in some fashion. And sometimes when we really need them, I think they're there whether we're aware of it or not. And as I said to you earlier, when I was in real trouble with the movie and I just didn't know what to do and I didn't have my father to ask, I asked him and he answered. And there's times I speak to my sister where I swear to God, she answers me before I even finish the question. And so I don't think it's me answering. It's like, cause I didn't, first of all, I hadn't finished the question. And second of all, it's an answer that I didn't expect. So there's a weird dynamic where I sometimes wonder if they're not still inside of us. Well, and the reality is even if it was a psychotic break, and you were having some crazy episode, or it really is your family talking to you from beyond, it doesn't matter because it's left you with such a wonderful feeling. It's helped you cope. It's helped you move on. You haven't hurt anybody else in the process. And I always tell people like, look, I, when I, when my father passed away, the hospice nurse encouraged me to still talk to my dad. She's like, just talk to him, say the things you want to say. And so over the years, there's been a few moments where I've been like, 
Hey dad, I'm thinking about you today. And I just want to let you know, I love you and I miss you. And, you know, and I still talk to him sometimes and I don't care if that makes me crazy. It really makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. You know? No, I don't think you're crazy at all. As I said, I actually hear them answer me. I may be the real crazy one here. <laughs> I, I wish I heard my dad answer me. You know, you I wish he'd be like, Hey, lay off the Oreos. What's the matter with you? You may <laughs> is I'm telling you, if you just open your mind kind of thing, open it to the cosmos, like don't expect anything, but just open it and be there with them. It's that's when it happens for me. Vanita, do you feel like you ever have everything figured out? Like life, career, family, all of it? <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> no. Um, I, I walk with a sense of wonder every day. Every day I'm astonished that I'm alive, that I am where I am. I had like the talking head song. How did I get here? <laughs> How did I get this beautiful <laughs> house? Water flowing under. Life is amazing. It's a mystery. And I'm just glad I'm alive. Has there been a key to your success? Perseverance. And if you hadn't worked for so many years in entertainment, what do you think you would have done? Been an artist, a fine artist, a painter or a sculptor. Can you name one big career ambition you haven't achieved that you still want to? Yes. To have an outside source finance my fucking movie. <laughs> I want somebody to hand me a bag of money and say, here, go make your film. <laughs> well, if I ever have the money, I will happily be your executive producer. Thank you. <laughs> I have some life questions for you, Vanita. Besides family and friends and career, what are you most passionate about in life today? Animals. A animals are astonishing. I have discovered that they are so much more communicative with us than we realize, uh, at least for me personally, but I see it with other people too. They have so much to offer us and tell us and show us, and we're just not open to it. And I learned this lesson from having a parrot. I got a little Blue Mountain lorikeet for my son, and I wound up wearing her on my shoulder for seven years, and we became totally bonded. Oh, cool. And I could read her mind. She read mine. We communicated without words. Uh, it was the best lesson I ever had in my life and my, the greatest love of my life, mm. truly. Bridget used to say, Mom, you love that bird more than you love us. And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. What was your favorite childhood book? Grimm's Fairy Tales, because they are so <laughs> dark. Oh, my God. I remember being... You're so Latvian. Yes, three years old. I remember my father reading them to me. And I remember going, they ate the little boy. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and, and I remember my father even going... Yeah, this is a little intense. <laughs> when you look back on your life, how did your priorities change as you got older? What's different now than when you were 20, 30, 40, et cetera? They change on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> they really do. Um, I, you know, I could say that 10 years ago, they changed to where my priority was now. I raised the damn kids. Now it's about making a movie. <laughs> God damn it. And so I spent the last 10 years doing that. So now... That's starting to shift a little bit. I've almost conquered it. The last thing I need to conquer is to do a feature length version of my script. You know, I directed somebody else's script. And then that bucket list thing will have been accomplished. And that doesn't mean I don't want to. I love making movies. I was born to make movies. It's just my passion. And I'll probably do it until I can't do it anymore. And I'll die running a set. What do you do with your spare time? Like, what are your hobbies? What spare time? <laughs> There's spare time. <laughs> All I do is work on, ask my husband. I wake up and I start working on my movies. <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, we'll skip that one then. Do you have a favorite food? Marzipan. Oh, cool. First person to say that. I'm That's interesting. A marzipan. I can't not eat it. I'm a junkie. Uh, my son would always get me these huge 24 packs of little marzipan fruits. And within three days, it'd all be gone. And I'd be sick as a dog, but I could not stop eating them. <laughs> <laughs> Vendita, if you were elected president of the United States of America today, what are the first three things you would do? Wow, that, that's an intense one. The first one would be to tell everybody that they were free, free to do and say what they want to say and do without the government interfering with them. Um, that being choice over your body and, and anything. We're not a free country at all. And that is devastatingly painful to me. I grew up thinking America was land of the free, home of the brave. Well, it's not. And we need to change that. 
That's for civil liberties. Number two? Get church out of state completely. I agree. Number three? Universal health care. Everybody has a right to, to having health care. Everybody. You got my vote, President Ozels Graham. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So one of my favorite questions to ask on the show, if you could sit for four hours in an old timey pub, let's say this time in Latvia. And you can sit there with any person from all of human history, alive or dead, except for any of your family members and any prophet like Jesus, Moses, or Mohammed. Who would you sit with? What would you drink? And what would you want to ask them? The first question. Roman Polanski. I'd have some schnapps. And I'd ask him what his childhood was like. Why is that? Because I do know that his parents were killed um, in a concentration camp. And as a boy, I believe he was 11 or 12, he had to cross uh, two countries to get to France by himself. And I know that that formed him as the person he was. And yes, I know that there's a lot of baggage with the gentleman, but he's always been um, my idol as a filmmaker uh, in college. He's who influenced me to want to become a filmmaker. I saw his college thesis films and they were brilliant. And then Chinatown and then, I mean, Rosemary's Baby and then uh, Catherine Deneuve's film, Repulsion. He is a man of completely my taste and style in filmmaking. And I would like to know more about him as a person. What's your guilty TV pleasure? Oh, I fall asleep to the forensic files every night. <laughs> every night. I can't fall asleep without listening to his mellifluous voice talking about decapitations. And my husband, I go to bed before my husband. He says he comes in and I'm lying there with a typical smile on my face, sound asleep. And he's saying, they found the head 10 feet from the body. And he's like, oh, my God. <laughs> Vanita, if you could continue to live a healthy life, and I stress healthy, how long would you like to live? 76. Not past that? Nope. Why is that? Because I've seen a lot of older people in my family, uh, friends' families. I've watched the progression of health, and I know my own body. And from what I suss out, I don't think that I would be a very happy, decrepit old lady. <laughs> Well, um, no, but my caveat was a healthy life. So yeah. let's say you don't fall apart and you're just a happy old lady who can still get around and do things. And you're so if you're healthy, if modern medicine okay. does even more great things, how long would you like to live if you were healthy? Every last second I could suck out a life. Uh, I mean, right to the bitter end, because I would love to see grandchildren. Bridget. <clears throat> <laughs> Are you afraid of dying? Hell Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's well, it's just funny because you work so much in horror and see all these horrible things and blood and guts. And it's okay. interesting that you're afraid of dying. Somebody once asked me why I was obsessed with horror and it made me have to think about it. And I, I figured it out. And that's that I am so afraid of horrifying things that I take them and control them in my art. And it's my way of controlling the things that scare me most. It's they don't affect me. They can't hurt me. That's fantastic, actually. Mm -hmm. If you could tell your younger self anything, go back in time to see 15 or 20 year old Vanita, what would you say to her? You are absolutely brilliant in your eccentricity. And that what makes you unique is what makes you valuable. Well said, my friend. Well said. What do you think is the purpose of art? I personally think it's self-expression. Um, I know a lot of people think that it's communication, and it is that as well. But I think that people have been trying to express themselves and how they view the world from the beginning of time. What does success in life look like to you? I have it already. Hmm. Doing what you love to do. And it can, might not be exactly the way you pictured it. That's one of the things in life that I found interesting. Human beings set up a goal and an image of what they think is going to make them happy, and they strive for it. And a lot of times, as John Lennon said, you know, you miss life that's happening right now because you're looking over there. But I do believe that you can discover that you have accomplished your goal, not in the way you thought it would be, but in the way life gave it to you. Mm -hmm. We don't have the control we wish we had, but we can guide our little canoe up that river as best we can. And hopefully 
discover something that makes it all the trip all worthwhile. I think that's really beautiful. That's that's really nice. What is your spirit animal? A llama. Oh, that's awesome. Why a llama? <laughs> they are the most, they look like aliens, like little E.T. <laughs> little heads on top of the long necks. But I stare at them endlessly and I can so envision myself just slowly walking through a field with my little head rotating around. And with all my other little llama friends, um, I would be happy as a clam <laughs> being in a llama field. That's... <laughs> That's awesome. Or alpaca, either or. Well, Vanita, the last thing we do on the show is a little game called 299 Philosophical and Life Questions with Moonbird. I get to ask you to pick two numbers. I have a list here of questions, 299 of them collected from my friends, family, and the in- lovely internet. You pick your two favorite numbers. I'll ask you those two questions. 69. And? 171. 69 and 171. 69, besides any partner in your life, who is the person you are closest with? My daughter. Okay. 171. Oh, this is the first time this question has been asked on the show, Vanita. You ready? This is a very serious one. So here we go. Sweater or hoodie? (laughs) Hoodie. (laughs) Now, why why hoodie? Well, sweaters you got to pull over your head. It messes up your hair. Sometimes they can be itchy. But it's easy. You just throw it on. <laughs> Zip up and go. That's right. Vanita, let's say it's 20, 30, 40 years from now, and your children listen to this podcast again for fun, just to hear mom's voice. What would you want to say to them from the future and the beyond? You are the greatest joy of my life. That's it. Okay, great. That's it. <laughs> Short and sweet and right to the point. I love it. I can't thank you enough for being on the show. I can't wait to see your film win all the festivals and become a huge success and uh, look forward to when you're directing a big feature. Oh, I will be calling you because you are such a good actor, Daniel. I mean, it was oh, so much fun you. working with you. you. Honestly, working on your set was my favorite experience in Hollywood so far. So thank you. <laughs> That means a lot. Thank you. Well, best of luck with everything and hopefully you come back on the show and please give Bridget a big hug and hopefully we'll see you soon. Okay. Love you. Love you too. And thanks so much. Okay. Good night. Friends and listeners, if you'd like to check out Vanita's latest horror short, Who Wants Dessert, head on over to nightmaresfest.com. The link to that and other links for Vanita's work are available in the show notes. And while you're surfing the web looking for scary things, head on over to patreon.com forward slash moonbird and show your support for the show. And if you'd like even more Moonbird in your life, and hey, who wouldn't? Head on over to memoriesofamoonbird.com or visit me on social media. You know the link by now, at memoriesofamoonbird. Stay safe, everybody. Oh.